ZZ Top was three guys that really liked to play. That's really the cornerstone of what does it for us. Our first uh, inclination is to throw the instruction manual away. We never know exactly what we're going to be doing. We never know exactly what we're doing. If you stay tuned, it'll be, it'll be coming your way. First time the three of us played a song together. We played a shuffle that lasted for hours. When Frank counted it off until we ended it, it, it was wonderful. You know, so uh, the combination was there from the beginning. When the playing began, we we knew that there was something that that seemed to feel right. It was a logical magnetism. Uh, even though I started playing about when I was 13, uh, my troubles di didn't really start until I met these guys. <laughs> <laughs> the first time uh, I heard Billy play, and this was long after uh, his band, The Moving Sidewalks, had been very big in Houston and Texas, and, and Dusty and my band, uh, The American Blues, had uh, been big up around Dallas ways and both made records and everything. But I'd never seen Billy play, and the first time I saw him play, it was like the feeling of finding someone that was like a missing. You, you, you didn't know they were missing until you saw them, and then you thought, wow. We've all known each other through the Texas connection, and it was instantaneous. We played for, oh, half a day, and uh, went and got some sleep, came back, played another half a day, went out and got some Mexican food, played it on into that night, and it's been going for quite a while now. I'd say the first three years, the opening song was always Shuffle and See. It's our favorite tempo. I think some of uh, our most noteworthy songs have been in that tempo. Cush, LaGrange, uh, My Head's in Mississippi. The shuffle's a cornerstone for Texas Sam. Uh, going back T-Bone Walker on a Friday night, I could shuffle all night. It's probably the most fun tempo to play in. Texas, you can listen to the radio, you hear all these musics. Country, Jesus. Yeah, Billy, blues. R&B. It's all there. All of, all of this mixes together and overlaps. Texas is very large, so when you're driving across the state, it gets kind of lonely out there. And your radio is your link, you know? And they had the the, the border stations on the other side in Mexico with 500,000 watts just blasting. There was religious shows and they would play 30 minutes of religious music and then there would be uh, a blues show, hillbillies. Uh, 
anything you wanted to listen to, and it would be coming through clear as a bell because of this, this tremendous power. I heard it, I heard it, I heard it on the X. But that was the glue that bound all through Texas was these stations that, that were so loud that I think you could hear them in Chicago on a clear night. It all place in that, that mysterious role of influences. Bo Diddley's been an influence. Bo Diddley stands among a list that's uh, a fairly lengthy one in terms of uh, blues singers that, that have had a profound effect on uh, what we do. I and think uh, Velcro Fly would probably be the, the best example of, of Bo Diddley's influence on ZZ Top. All of Bo Diddley's songs, the rhythm was such a strong factor, you know, and uh, the, with us, we like to thank the beat or the rhythm is a strong factor in uh, a lot of our tunes. From Lightning Hopkins to Elvis Presley to, to the English group, it's like Cream. All these people had a sameness in my mind, you know? They had a energy and uh, the different styles didn't make uh, that much difference to me. Probably one of the biggest influences in the early days was Ginger Baker. I mean, uh, you couldn't be a musician around Texas and, and not want to be like the cream. I mean, it seemed like when that record came out, it was a totally new and different thing. It was blues and rock and roll, and it was driving, and it was three-piece, and it was everything that uh, I wanted to do. Texas and being influenced by the blues is one and the same, and it, you never get it out of you, you know. The, the old scene, you can take the boy out of Texas, but not the Texas out of the boy, you know, it's the same thing with the uh, music influences. The funny thing is, you bring all of these influences in, you bring them uh, into this strange place called Texas, and it does something peculiar, and yet it's uh, very identifiable, so it's interesting. I grew up in Irving, which is a suburb of Dallas. Uh, never really, you know, liked music, but never really thought about playing music until the Beatles did the Ed Sullivan Show. Saw that that night and uh, changed my life. I was raised here in Houston, and uh, some people choose a deck of cards. I chose six strings. And uh, I attacked it. I just went for it. And uh, it's still a great friend. It's a burden and a friend. I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I started singing about the age of eight with my brother Rocky uh, in front of the little bands that were playing these little beer joints. And I remember the, the reason I thought I turned professional at eight is because they'd throw change on the table beside us. My brother was singing harmony. And I asked my mother who the money was for. She said, well, it's for you. We started in Texas. Then we gradually got into Louisiana, Oklahoma, Mexico. Uh, just kind of grew like this. I mean, it took three years maybe for us to get across the Mason-Dixon line. But in 72 or 73, uh, we had the opportunity to play with the Rolling Stones in Hawaii. They asked us uh, to play on the show, which blew us away. You know, we only had two albums out or something. And it was frightening because uh, the Stones fans are so intent on just seeing them and uh, we wore cowboy hats and wore boots and jeans and played rock and roll and people didn't do that back then. But uh, we did well on those shows and that gave us some pretty big boots. Trace Ombres was the album that broke us nationally. 
that was our first album that sold a million copies, and so that was the album that, that established us. Fandango was released as half live, half studio. And the one studio track, of course, that uh, was getting a lot of attention was a song that we wrote in Florence, Alabama at a sound check uh, called Tush. Worldwide Texas tour, which was 76. Uh, Frank took off for the Caribbean. Dusty wound up in Mexico somewhere. Uh, I took off for points beyond. Just took off. Just took off. <laughs> but uh, we returned in 79. Well, we got back together. Uh, Billy's beard was for getting very long, and so was mine. We didn't know about one another, you know. And uh, what started off as a uh, disguise turned into now a tradition. One of our favorite tracks on the Guelo was uh, Cheap Sunglasses. The origin of that tune perhaps came from the fact that uh, when you work 300 days a year and you're driving, a lot of times the uh, morning hours are spent behind the wheel trying to make it to the next show, a pair of sunglasses more than likely they would be picked up at a truck stop uh, for not very much money. Uh, we'll get you through that <laughs> morning. Um, we recommend them. Go get yourself some cheap sunglasses. In 1981, uh, we did an album called uh, El Loco. This was uh, probably our first uh, effort in uh, using any sort of instrument other than uh, guitar, bass, and drums and the horns that we'd played uh, on the Guaya. You know, El Loco, uh, we felt good about. You know, it felt, it felt good to stretch our, spread our wings a little bit more, so to speak. So that was kind of the threshold that we explored and went on into a little further with Eliminator. We learned about video six months before our Eliminator album was being made. Frank had called me up and he says, man, there's a real interesting music show on. And eight hours later, he called me back and he said, uh, how long is this show? And of course, it was MTV, which was 24 hours long. And about a day later, we figured it out. That was really the first exposure to music video that, that we had. So when we decided to do one, we went in with the same feeling as we do writing uh, songs. You know, like, uh, let's have some fun with this and see how it works. So we just jumped with both feet in the middle of it. Billy had made the Eliminator car previous to our uh, cutting of the record. So when the record came out, we decided to name it Eliminator. We've always loved cars. We've always, you know, in Texas, you got to have a good car. you got to go from here to there. It takes a long time. And so the cars was a natural. The girls was, you know, that was just bonus. I mean, uh, our thinking was in the beginning uh, to have a little story going on and let us participate, but not participate. Let us be there, but let the girls be our hands. It wasn't until I think the Legs video came out, which kind of completed that first trilogy of, of Give Me All Your Love and Sharp Dress Man and Legs, that people started putting everything together and, and, and discovering what ZZ Top meant to ZZ Top. You know, it's a band that uh, likes to play good music, have a good time, not take themselves <coughs> too seriously. to make the Recycler record, we had prepared a body of material that was fairly similar to Afterburner. Hey, where is that? Oddly enough, the Recycler record had a lot of bluesy uh, return to roots elements. 
We got to the studio and our equipment was lagging behind a couple of days. We went up to Memphis early and found some instruments there that we could, you know, play on. So we set up a studio set of drums and Billy found an old guitar somewhere and, and we started playing a shuffle, of course. So we sat down and, and wrote My Head's in Mississippi. One afternoon we had a break from the studio and we piled in a car, drove down through the Delta and uh, stumbled across the Delta Blues Museum. Went in and uh, happened to be there on a day that the director and an associate, Jim O'Neill, were paying a visit to the uh, Muddy Waters cabin. Came back with a souvenir stick of wood and dropped it off uh, back in Memphis at a guitar shop. Shortly thereafter, a uh, bona fide piece of playable blues memorabilia was born, the Muddy Wood guitar. And it was the band's contribution, I guess, back to what we felt we had based a career on this art form called the blues. Presently, the museum is still uh, uh, accepting contributions and donations, and they're building toward a uh, time when they can uh, more properly house the uh, collection that they now possess. It's uh, kind of an ongoing uh, living museum. Being there in the Delta, you get to feel it as well. It's a real interesting experience. On the Greatest Hits album, we individually picked uh, some of our favorites. And then we uh, had some that we felt, you know, were naturals to be on it. And we wanted a good variety. That plus the two new selections that we hadn't recorded previously, we thought uh, was a good span of uh, the years we've been through. Viva Las Vegas is not necessarily considered one of Elvis's most famous works, but it's certainly uh, one that has a lot of glam and trash that appeal to us. We started doing a song in the dressing room before the shows, and then it progressed to the uh, sound checks stage, and then uh, to the studio. We all uh, love Elvis, you know, a lot. So it was easy to decide to do an Elvis song. When I was around eight years old, I started singing uh, Elvis Presley tunes, and uh, my mother was a big Elvis Presley fan, right? So I've been working on the Elvis voice a long, long time. Yeah, I was gonna say, God knows he's worked on it for 30 years. I mean, he, he ought to sound like Elvis. I've, I've I mean. driven these guys crazy behind him. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you very much. And my mama too, thank you. The thing is that uh, people that listen to us early on, a uh, great deal of them are still listening, you know. Uh, and the people that came on board around Eliminator, Afterburner, uh, you know, they have their favorites, you know. So it, it makes for a, uh, a real mixture in the audience. ZZ Top's always been curious. If it's there and uh, it's musical, we're going to try to, to experiment with it in some form or fashion. The general feeling of the band is that we enjoy playing first and foremost. That's what uh, makes it click for us. And the longer we've played together, the tighter that, that's gotten. So, uh, you know, it's uh, stronger now than it was before. Even. It's a very comfortable situation. 